Father, thank you very much for giving us this time, Lord, that we brothers and sisters could gather through Zoom platform to study your word, O Lord. Lord, especially this moment, we ask you for your special anointing upon uh, Sachin as he's going to teach us from your word, a book of Romans. Lord, we want uh, we want to hear your voice, O Lord, by your spirit anointing by your enlight uh, sorry and uh, empowerment lord we all may be ministered by your spirit the time we spend in discussions may be mutually edifying to us your name be exalted through everything we do in jesus name we pray amen over to pastor sachi sorry a very good evening and very good to be back with you all one second let me just share my screen so i see less of myself um, stop share. One minute, yeah. Today we have a lot of things happening. Today is Shanti's birthday. Uh, the people coming to wish us home. I was in the middle of completing my work so that evening I'll get uh, to spend with you all. So in the midst of all today, we are having a busy day, but I'm so glad to be back with you all. Um, recently, I've been to, to Dhaka for work and there I had a privilege to meet uh, other GCI uh, brethren in, in in Dhaka. Now Dhaka is a very young church uh, led by uh, a friend Amio Bakar. He is in another town from Dhaka which is about three hours away and he has uh, different house churches uh, in, in different towns and Dhaka also has one of the gathering. So they are about uh, the whole, whole church is about 40-50 people and I was able to meet most of the, 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 their leadership team and they all came to they all came to Dhaka. So we all met, had a wonderful time meeting them, uh, sharing, uh, exchanging, uh, and they were so excited to share their uh, the, the, what's happening in, in, in their life, in their church life. And recently they conducted um, youth camp and then they were sharing how the youth camp went. They copied uh, the content from the Philippines church uh, and it was wonderful to see uh, how it is. And I was so happily sharing my testimony with them, hearing how they do, how they manage. And it, it was an amazing one day experience. And it's the first time in my work uh, trip, I was able to meet somebody from GCI. So I was very excited. So that, that's, that's something what has been happening in my life. I'll just put my phone on mute. Yeah. Now back to our weekly Bible study, uh, we, as you know, we are doing the New Testament survey. Survey means we'll see uh, who wrote it, what were the circumstances, what is some of the background, uh, and, and what was the culture during that time, and so on and so forth. Uh, if time permits, we, we jump into the uh, theological themes uh, of the books, but sometimes if the book is quite big, then we will just uh, pass through it as a survey. And last time we did was we introduced uh, the character of Paul, who he was, what was uh, the influence of uh, Judaism on him, uh, influence of Christianity, how that transformed his theology, his teaching. And now knowing who Paul uh, was, his style of dealing, now we'll now dwell into his epistles to various churches and today we will be doing uh, the uh, survey of the the letter uh, letter to the romans now if you oops sorry uh, at the end of his third missionary tour paul remained in corinth for about three months and he reflected on his future ministry uh, once again, he wanted to go uh, west, uh, wanting to go as far as Spain. 
but first he hoped uh, to visit the imperial capital of Rome, where Christian community was already growing. Now, uh, the this epistle, the letter to the Romans, is Paul's most thorough statement of theology. You know, it has been enormously uh, influences, uh, influential in the church history, and it's important for us today. Yeah. So Paul's letter to Roman is his longest uh, epistle, and that's why also it explains why it is in the uh, first uh, in the New Testament in the canon of uh, Paul's letter. Now, while uh, some view it as his best systematic treatment of Christian faith, I, I forgot to put the right um, animations to it. So some scholars believe that it was his best systematic treatment of Christian faith. But Paul nevertheless write with an awareness he, uh, of critical issues that he need to address in the church in Rome. Now, although he never visited this church, but the Christian couriers, uh, they commonly brought the news of development throughout the Mediterranean region. And that's how he was aware of what's happening in the church in Rome. Now, the Roman Christians uh, were thus well known in Greece. So, so the news about uh, uh, Roman Christians was very much aware in Greece as we read it in Romans chapter 1 verse 8 and then later in verse 16. So, Paul can write to them addressing these specific issues. So, before we jump into it, uh, jump into the, his epistle, let's see a little bit about a city of Rome as it was during that time. So, now Rome, Rome was an astonishing city. Now, by the first century, an extensive system of aqueduct provided most of the city with clean water. It's the first century, by the way. They had sewer systems, they have public latrines, and they had public bath that increased the level of sanitation. They had multi-storied buildings with internal plumbing, which was quite common to see. Augustus, uh, who between 27 BC and ruled until AD 14, he even installed a police force and fire, uh, fire prevention unit. Monuments, government building, libraries, uh, resources, and theatres displayed impressive feat of engineering and architecture. That was a Roman city, a city Rome. Now Rome has served as a capital of the entire Mediterranean world for nearly two centuries and it was famous for its cultural and intellectual centre. So both ruled. The lure of this city with its thousands of miles of paved roads that brought people from all the corner of the empire, uh, empire. So the people were civilized and uncivilized. Let me read it in uh, chapter one, verse 14. Now medical colleges and gladiator spectacles were equally popular in the city of Rome. Now by the end of second century, uh, Rome reached the pinnacle of its power, prosperity and population. And it had an estimation population of about 1 million. That's the population of Rome. Now, uh, religion was central to Roman political and social life. Priests frequently counseled the Senate on issues like making war and interpreting the law. Religious oracles were consulted to predict the future. Extravagant religious festivals were part of the fabric of everyday life. But remember, it was not, however, one religion, but a blend of many represented uh, in the city of Rome. Now, the Romans usually assimilated the gods of conquered people, merging them with the Roman pantheon. And they required those they conquered to adapt Roman divinities. Now, to desecrate any temple in the empire was a capital crime. 
and that is why the Roman struggled with Jewish and then later the Christian population claims to theological exclusivity, exclusivity which is God is one and their God is the one true living God. Now refuse, refusal to embrace the imperial religious spirit deemed Jews and Christian uh, exclusive and intolerant and because of that it also led for their persecution because remember Roman uh, they, they respected all the religions and, and it was a blend of it but when the Jews and later the Christians they, they forced on the exclusivity on, on theological on their God and, and refused to bow down to other gods it uh, made them um, subject to persecution now let's see the church in Rome now one thing to note is Paul did not start the Roman church people from Rome were present on the day of Pentecost as we read it in Acts chapter 2 verse 10 and they may have formed the nucleus of church in Rome now we see in Romans 16 that Paul knew number of Christians in Rome people move around the empire and that could have led the church uh, forming in Rome too uh, composed of Jews uh, originally uh, taught by other apostles as well as some who were taught by Paul now it's possible that no one in particular started the church it's possible it could be just that the believers in in Rome just found each other and then they started a uh, fellowship at home and uh, th that's how the church formed in Rome now the next thing is many Christians in Rome did not know Paul so the first is Paul did not start the Roman church and the second is many Christians in Rome did not know Paul uh, just give me a moment please Sorry, as I said, the guests are coming over to wish uh, and we have a house full of guests. Anyway, so the second point I wanted to bring about the church in Rome is that many Christians in Rome, they did not know Paul. We did not know if Rome was a territory of any other particular leader, but we know that Paul was always very cautious about working, working in someone else's territory. So now, when he wrote to Rome, he wrote as an outsider asking to be allowed in the, their community. Now, he had no previous relationship with the church in Rome and had never been their leader. So he could not count on having a lot of personal authority to them. So, so that, that was the background. The next thing is that Paul is writing this letter at a transition point in his ministry now he has ministered in the northeast part of the roman empire feels that he has achieved uh, his goals in that area as we read it in romans chapter 15 verse 19 and now he wants to bring the gospel to the new place and he knows that believers are already in italy so he look beyond to go to spain as we read it in verse 24 but before Paul went there, he wanted to go to Jerusalem with an offering given from the Gentile churches to the Jewish churches, as we read it in verse 25 to 28. Now, this was a gesture of unity between two people, but he was not sure the Jewish believers would accept it, the Jewish believers in Judea, because there was a lot of ethnic tensions that was rising in Judea. Now, Paul is apparently writing this epistle from Corinth, as we read it in chapter 16, verse 23, and in the year about AD 57. Now, he has few months to gather his thought, to think about what he will say 
to his enemies in Jerusalem, that is the people who was opposing uh, Paul, you know, those Pharisees. Uh, what he would say to the supporters in Rome and what he would say to the strangers in Spain. So he took that time to think about it. Now his letter to Roman is also not written in haste. It is a well organized and carefully written letter. Now one plausible view is that Paul writes this extensive letter because he had a bad feeling about what will happen in Judea when he visits, as we read it in um, Romans chapter 15, verse 32, 33. If he is arrested or even killed, this letter will be his theological legacy, guiding the Roman church and perhaps other in his absence. But Paul is also looking to the Roman Christian for practical financial support. His journey to Spain will be expensive. And so the Roman church can offer him some help as we read it in chapter 15, verse 26 to 29. So, so that's the, 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 how the church in Rome was. Now let's see what is the settings of Roman. Now, what is the, what, what was the situation in Rome? Now chapter 16 suggests that there are several house churches in Rome. There's not one particular, there are several house churches you know uh, in verse 5 mentioned one but several other names in these chapters are probably the leaders of the various house churches now paul's in his letter paul names many people as he uh, as he can but there are many more believers that he does not know there may have been about 200 or so believers in rome at that time now meet and they were all meeting in about a dozens of half a dozens of home because Rome was a very uh, was the largest city in the empire. So it would have been geographically very difficult for everybody to gather at one place. Now the Jews were scattered into various synagogues with no formal means of coordination. And it is likely that the Christian churches fell into the same pattern. Now, one recent event in Rome, in, in Roman's history, probably influenced the church a great deal. So one major event happened. And what was that? In about year 49, 49 AD, there was apparently some violence between those who accepted Jesus and those who did not. And we also read about this uh, violence in the book of Act, uh, where we see that some Jews responded to the gospel with violence. Claudius, uh, the ruler at the time, uh, the, the governor, decided to solve the problem by expelling all the Jews from Rome. Even though there may have been about 40,000 of them. But it is likely that some, uh, some, some of the uh, Jews in the Rome uh, stayed back despite the decree. But many left, as we read it in Acts chapter 18, verse 2. The, now the author, uh, author uh, Actemir, Green and Thompson, they write that all the Jews were expelled by Claudius is specifically denied by another Roman historian, uh, Cossius Dio. Why? Who says that Claudius could not expel them all because of the tumult it would have caused. Rather he, he, rather, he says, Claudius forbade their meeting together. Uh, which means, in, in either scenario, Christians would end up being led by Gentiles because all the Jews had to leave, um, leave Rome. So, um, the Gentiles Christians remained in Rome. Now, the decree of Claudius expired when he died and Jews began to move back to Rome. Now the Jews who were used to leading the congregation find that now these uh, congregations are being led by Gentiles uh, and to the new leaders and, and that uh, they, they had a problem with that. And also the most of the Gentiles believers, they look forward to the new leaders ladder, rather than the old Jewish leaders who were leading them. Now, further, during these years in which the Jews were absent, 
the gentiles may have adopted customs that jews did not like such as eating pork and the people who used to lead the congregation find themselves as aliens and minorities in what once had been their domain domain imagine jews were leading it before they were expelled out now they come back the seas being led by gentiles customs are different and suddenly their own uh, uh, religion they finding themselves as a, a, a being end up in minority now some jewish christians may have formed jewish house churches and some may have been in ethnically mixed churches so it could be possible that uh, once they had these differences jews would have jews christian would have had their own churches some would have been in the mixed churches which is ethnically mixed churches now this probability created some tension between the jewish believers and gentile believers partly of the pride and partly of which customs to keep now since paul knew a few christians in rome he is also aware of these tensions and he can address these tensions in his letters letter now some of the, the the comments are targeted to gentiles in the letter and some are to the jews so that's the setting of the the romans now what led apostle paul to write the letter to the church in rome that is the purpose of romans now older commentators often acted as if paul wrote romans the way they were reading it to give us a Uh, synopsis of christian doctrine perhaps summation of his theology but this letter is not a complete statement of faith paul's letter to the church in rome is not a complete statement of faith because lot supper is in mention and the resur- resurrection is barely mentioned so now the scholars have offered explanation for why paul would uh paul wrote this letter and the first thing is paul wanted rome to support his mission to spain the primary objective or, or one of the objective is paul wanted rome to support his mission to spain when he said that he wanted to uh, he wanted them to send him on his way he used the word sometime used for outfitting an expedition he wanted financial helps and perhaps a people to accompany him on his trip to spain he thought he could give them spiritual help and they could give him material help so paul describe uh, the gospel he is asking them to support and he explain why he preaches it to the gentiles that's the reason number 1 now second is paul also wanted to address some legalistic teaching in roman churches the doctrine that has divided jews and gentiles now he had spent many year dealing with the jewish and gentile tensions and felt strongly that the gospel called the ethnic group together into one people he was a strong believer in that he deals with a specific problem in roman 14 and 15 but throughout the letter he knows that jews and gentile stand equal in need of salvation now this could also help dampening the ethnic tension that was at high all time high his letter to the uh, galatians tend to be combative calling for sharp separation between christianity and judaism but roman he, the letter to roman is more peacemaking calling from for different people to stay together the third is Paul also knows that some people have spread false rumors about what he preaches and he want to explain what he really preaches and why he does that he want to explain this in Jerusalem too but he is going there in person his letter to the romans may be a practice run for what he will say in Jerusalem you see so so he he is preparing his case now he may have kept a copy of his letter as a evidence to what he has been teaching the gentiles now uh, this uh, calls uh, so that is how it is now another author uh, gorman he concludes that many scholars agree that there is a variety of reasons for paul to write to romans 
Now let's see the outline of the letter uh, to the Romans. So it starts with <coughs> opening greetings. Then there is a body of the letter. It starts with thanksgiving leading into the thesis statement. Then it talks about the gospel is the power of God. It brings salvation and it reveals God's righteous name. Then the second is the ineffective way that is the sinful and the guilt of all humanity. So everyone is accountable to God for sin. Jews are accountable to God for their sins and guilt of all humanity he brings. Then later he goes, the way that work, justification by faith. Then he goes, the place of the law, the new life in the spirit. He talks in more detail about how the law cannot justify. Uh, serving, observing the law cannot justify us. Uh, the only way for justification is by faith. Then he goes on the <clears throat> he goes on identifying with the problem of Jewish unbelief and God's plan for Jews and Gentiles to be together. Then uh, he goes on God's righteousness and worldwide mission, salvation for all Israel. Then it goes on the practical aspect of Christian living. He gives relationship with the outside world. Okay, so now um, observe faith in action. Living uh, that is living in the light of Christ, then we see unity despite differences in custom and it, his travel plan and then his close, uh, closing greetings. That's the outline of the entire uh, Paul's letter to the Romans. Now the next one is the central theme of Romans. Now Paul starts his letter by saying that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel chapter 1 verse 17 he then writes two chapter about how everyone falls short of what the law says and then in chapter 3 verse 21 he writes but now apart from the law the righteousness of god has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets in other words the approach to righteousness described in Romans chapter 1 verse 8 through chapter 3 verse 20 does not work. It is not the gospel that that doesn't work. That is the justification by law. Since we are sinners, we cannot be declared righteousness by observing the law. It must be through some other means. God will declare us righteous in a way other than through the law and although the law does not make us righteous it does give evidence about another means of righteousness the righteousness is given through faith in jesus christ to all who believe there is no difference between the jew and the gentile the righteousness is a gift we do not deserve it, but God gives us as the status of being counted as righteousness. Now, because Jesus was faithful, we can be given the status of being righteous because of Jesus. And that's the starting point of Paul's explanation of the gospel. And as we move towards the, the conclusion, Romans is the most sustained doctrinal discussion in Paul's letters. It centers on the place of Jews and Gentiles in God's saving purpose, defends Paul's understanding of salvation by grace, shows how this grace works out in the new life of those who are justified by faith. It explains how God's promise to the Jewish people find its fulfillment in Christ. It explains how God's promise to the Jewish people find their fulfillment in Christ and applies the gospel to life together in Christian congregation. So that's about the survey of the book of Roman. We see uh, Paul as an outsider, how he brings uh, and address the tension that is happening between the Jews and Gentiles. The justification that the law does not provide and how it is uh, done through faith in Jesus Christ and how in Christ the Jews and Gentiles are one 
and that is how God's plan has always been. And as he clarifies and as he uh, aimed to resolve the differences between the Jews and the Gentiles, he is also uh, making an appeal for them to sponsor his next mission to Spain. So that's about uh, Romans. Next time when we meet, we will uh, we will dwell more into Paul's epistle to uh, first uh, that is Corinthians, the Christians in Corinthians church, First Corinthians and Second Corinthians. So that's about us today. Uh, if there are any um, comments or any question that I can help answer now, I would do that. Else I'll go back uh, and, and get the clarity for you. Over to you all. Any reflection? Yes, Sri Murthy. If you can unmute yourself. Yeah, you are now. You talked about the brethren in Dhaka. Yes. I just uh... I'm just curious to know how our brethren, Christians, are able to live in a Muslim country like Bangladesh. Okay. Uh, all, all, uh, while two things I'd like to I mean, share. One is my experience out of those 10 days that I moved around, and then their experience of how they are so for them the there is still uh, not a persecution but when the believers uh, are being converted from muslim um, uh, religion there is a, there is a tension and there is a sort of uh, defense to that moment so one example that uh, amir was sharing that in one village one family has accepted uh, jesus but then now their, 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 their relatives or the people in the, the neighborhood said they cannot, they, because they have converted, they cannot use the water from the well. And, and that was a very difficult situation. Now that's a very, uh, and, and that, that was not in a main town, in one of the villages where even Amyo is not there. So now he went into the authorities and now see here, that's a good thing, okay. Now the, it's a Muslim country ruled by the, um, the, the, the Muslim authorities. He went to the authorities and he shared that this has been happened and the authority was quite helpful in a way they said let's do one thing uh, we would we would sponsor half of the price to uh, dig the well and the half church to be taken care and they were able to raise uh, the second well for these believers. So what I want to bring in is that yes there there is a sort of rejection by by the Muslim um, people when they see their people being being converted that's number one but number two is that they are not uh, being persecuted as such as a group they are not being uh, pushed back of to not practice their religion they have the freedom of practicing their religion and the government seems to uh, have what do you say uh, openness to to support that so they, they are not uh, openly saying that they are not supporting but yes, uh, being the very minority because uh, it's it's a total Muslim country, they have problem. But God is working miraculously. The, the amount of people I have seen and I told them, I said, soon you should surpass uh, the brother in India. You know, so so that that's how it is. Thank you, Bertie. I I saw you raising your hand. I was just uh, saying hello to you all, waving, waving out. So nice. Waving. <laughs> so any reflection uh, from anyone on, on, on the letters to Rome? Suryamurthy, do you have any comments, especially on any part or any queries, clarity? Yeah, you, you may unmute and then share.
Paul is writing about taking offerings to Jerusalem. Yes. This also has been a point of uh, lot of curiosity. This is not the only place he is talking about taking offerings to Jerusalem. In some other places also he is talking about taking offerings to Jerusalem. So there are, there are two doubts. What is the problem with the Jerusalem people? Why were they needing offerings always? Offerings are this one. Two, in what form Paul was taking the offerings? See, was it by means of coins? Rupees? Currencies were not there. Maybe coins. I do not know. He could not have carried bundles of wheat or rice. Any idea? Very interesting observation, Sir Okay. And, and uh, up to the point which makes everyone think. Let me give my uh, my view on that. Then I would add, uh, ask Praveen to, to on top of, top of that and then others to share. So uh, why the the new churches, Gentile churches in particular, will was, were giving the offering to be shared towards Jerusalem. When Paul was sharing the gospel about Jesus, uh, now the the new new people who are new gentiles or new the jews who are coming into the christianism there was a bond of oneness you know because there was a bond of oneness a bond of unity and towards that unity they always felt the jerusalem to be the source of the, or let's say the, the mother church of or, or or the source of the christianity right so every new churches that were formed or every new sect of people that would come into the the the, the fellowship they all wanted to support and, and we have seen that feelings in acts the early act right how the people were sharing each other so that was one of the intention uh, of uh, sharing towards they did not bother uh, whether they will receive it not receive it they reject it and and the tension between Jews and Gentiles, that is the ethnic tension in Jerusalem was not all the time. There was one place where it was at a peak, where Paul had a, a concern of how it would be received. Next thing, uh, how Paul carried the the offering, interesting, I have no answer. Uh, this thing, I'll try to find something uh, and, and share next week. Um, Praveen, you want to add anything and then others please share. Uh, not much, but um, church it, uh, sorry, if you look at the church history from book of Acts, we find uh, from chapter 1 till chapter uh, 11, the church was centered in Jerusalem. And from chapter 12 onwards, the church was centered in Antioch and from there, uh, church was uh, functioning, though they were not uh, uh, having a complete denomination kind of such, but there was unity in the church and uh, they were functioning from uh, Antioch and all. And uh, Next thing was uh, uh, church at Jerusalem became quite poor because of uh, their practices. Uh, it, they, Paul was not taking funds to all the Jews actually. He was taking to the uh, church at Jerusalem because they sold off everything and they finished everything. <laughs> they didn't have uh, anything for themselves. So the church at Jerusalem was not in a position to run by itself. Uh, that's why Paul asked uh, for donations, and moreover, some persecution was uh, persecution was quite severe in Jerusalem, and uh, other parts of the Roman Empire. It was much better in comparison to Jerusalem. That is the reason they didn't have much uh, support. They were struggling. So Apostle Paul, even in his uh, last missionary journey, from going from Philippines to Jerusalem, he takes the funds. He take uh, he takes some donations to church at. Uh, Jerusalem. It is not for all the Jews, but yeah. especially for uh, church at uh, Jerusalem. So as uh, Sachin said, to have everything in common, it is possible. Uh, but uh, practically, that was not something completely God planned. The, the uh, apostles, they started it. So the practice ended up in a negative 
uh, results, but uh, later things have changed. In which form he has taken, I don't know either, but uh, I guess I feel to think uh, he was taking in some gold coins or something. I personally, I read somewhere that once uh, Apostle Paul was robbed, he was taking funds somewhere and he was robbed. Uh, I read somewhere, but I'm not very sure about it. <laughs> it's interesting. I think we need to study, come up with how he would be carrying. For sure, not not grains, not those things where it would have been very heavy for him to go from one place to another. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Even we can think uh, he could make some deals with the merchants they usually take. So mm -hmm. it is possible uh, that also we don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's quite interesting. Yes, Ani. When we're talking about how is uh, this possible or that possible, you know, like taking all that money, I have always wondered how <clears throat> starting right from Exodus, where there were, I think, what, uh, almost, what, 600,000 Jews or 60,000 that left uh, Egypt, how was Mo Moses able to proclaim his message to them at that time, there were no megaphones, no loudspeakers. How did he do that? Was it that he had people who, you know, communicate? It's just, it's not very clear. And even in uh, Jesus's uh, thing, where you know he uh, turns, uh, you know, that uh, feeding of the five thousand and four thousand. Even there, speaking to five thousand and five thousand were just the men. They estimate there were at least fifteen thousand people. How did he address them without any, you know, public addresses? Have anybody thought of that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, when we went to Greece, in in that on the hill we stood near the Acropolis, and then I just saw and I told Shanti, even if I have to shout at the peak of my throat, it would just go to the next thirty or forty feet. <laughs> And right. then, because Acropolis is itself on the high, right? Like, let's say it's here. And this is the hill, right? So now this is Acropolis, this is the hill, right? And now this is where we are seeing the whole Athens I'm seeing. Now imagine that, that could have been an answer. I wonder how. <laughs> yeah, that has really puzzled me. <laughs> anyway, yeah. that's for the bigger side. I, I just feel a couple of thoughts come to my mind. Uh, these are also not like, you know, uh, answers as such. Uh, but I feel uh, in terms of Moses thing, uh, what Jethro taught him uh, to make, to appoint leaders on one on tens, one on hundreds, one on thousands. So I, that uh, structure might have helped him. Uh, number one, it may take a day time. So, but the message would be uh, carried to everyone. So, and uh, uh, interestingly, um, I'm not very good at these signs and all, but one thing we interestingly we can see is Sermon on the Mount. We call it Sermon on the Mount, but actually Jesus will be coming down from the mountain. <laughs> he comes down from the mountain and he speaks. Maybe uh, just like these amphitheaters and all, they may be making use of uh, these, uh, what we call uh, resonance or reverberations or what we Acoustics. Acoustics and all they must yeah. be using, but that's also quite interesting. People might have found the right places where the, the acoustics works the best, and uh, we don't know. <laughs> Those are really quite interesting things we can think about. Even when Nehemiah read the scroll, yes, though that is more difficult, <laughs> and he reads whole day exactly. And they were fasting. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think also um, I, this semester I'm doing the church history. In in big events, we sometimes we fail to see the work of the Holy Spirit. But it is when these small events you try to, to, to uncover, that is when you see it could have been nothing else but the work of the Spirit. Nothing else comes to mind. Nothing else makes sense. Yes, please feel free. We'll see you next week. Adil and Rekha. Have a good day. Yeah. Bertie. Before, yes. Yes, before you left, I saw you raise your hand. So maybe you can share your comments, observation. 
Uh, no, I was, I guess I was out and I had to, I missed most part of the Bible study, Pastor Sachin, and uh, I raised my hand to wave out to you all, <laughs> to wave out to you all, and uh, just wanted to mention that uh, um, starting on my new job soon, and uh, uh, most likely I'm missing uh, uh, the big day <laughs> that is coming. Uh, I've never, I've hardly missed in 40, 50 years, I hardly missed two or three. That's it, you know. When I, when, once I was not well, my mother passed away one time. And another time, I just started with a new job. And now, uh, this job, um, a small job, small pay, uh, but something, something, it's a source of income which we are thankful for. Thank you, God. Even Doris is... Uh, working in a home, house, and uh, uh, a PT has left. And, uh, but uh, by God's grace and, and uh, thank you for your prayers, uh, I'm, I'm being taken care of, you know. So Bertrand is not working, he's at home. Uh, we, we two are, you know, we two are trying and uh, seeking work and a job uh, just to, you know, as a source of income, which helps us. And uh, yeah, taking care of our monthly expenses. No dire, we're not in dire straits. Don't get the wrong impression. Uh, Pastor Sachin, we are not in dire straits. We are taken care of, but we are ensuring that... Uh, uh, you know, source of income is coming in, you know, and uh, we, um, and God, we are trusting God, I say, people ask, you know, and I have to say, uh, we are trusting God for a source of income, and in that sense, God is providing one way or the other. So, nevertheless, thank you, uh, thank Benny, uh, thank Zakara, you know, who have, um, uh, sort of spontaneously <laughs> and there are some other brethren whom I have not named uh, have helped and I'm grateful Mr. You know, Nagar yeah. thank you you know Bertie yeah. we, we are so excited today when we heard the news and <laughs> I was and when you said I am not sure and I was telling myself the same God who has given you a job would make sure to give you a holiday when you will ask them because our own church historian is not present at the 50th uh, celebration. How can it be possible? So it is uh, a prayer, Bertie. It uh, is a prayer. It will be a one week's leave. Uh, I need to be granted one, leave, one week's leave. Uh, taking into consideration the travel time, the time at the venue, and uh, you know, being able to resume duty. It will be uh, not less than a week. I have to ask, uh, but pray, pray about it. And uh, when I was in Air India, <laughs> many times I did this. You know, I put my job at risk to come for the festivals and all. And <laughs> God kept me, kept me. You know, and ensured that nothing happened. And uh, so let's see this time also. <laughs> uh, this time I'm not so strong, like uh, you know. So committed in a sense, like I was in Air India, you know, just, you know, I was like pretty zealous at the time. But this time I passed through a little low for the still continuing to. And, um, uh, you know, sort of, that's why I, that's why I mentioned, <laughs> uh, you know, now as you say, and you give me hope. It's like 50 50 percent. Otherwise, I was saying that I'm not likely, like, you know, I'm like, you know, uh, direct uh, uh, mentioning directly. But now, as you say, Pastor Sachin, I think it's 50 50 chances. Yeah. We are praying. We are praying, Bertie. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And Lord, How are you doing? Uplift. We are, we are doing well. And in your fact, health, health is your much, health? much better. Much better. Thank God. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Nice to see you, Uncle Sanjeevara, Pauline. 
Surimati, you are an encouragement to us. Thank you. You join and you share such a good insight. Praise God. I missed most part of this Bible study, Pastor. Uh, in between, I was not having, uh, you know, uh, proper networks. So it was going off and, uh, and you know, coming on. Uh, firstly, I joined late <laughs> for the Bible study. And then after joining, I was, you know, having a poor, poor network. And I just missed made the most part of it. I'm sorry about it, and uh, yeah. And no, but, no problem, Bertie. Uh, yeah, I think Raveen will yeah. also upload the YouTube version, and we can understand that there can be challenges, you know, with the connectivity. Thank you. Looking forward to your, you and your family's visit. Yes. On, uh, huh? We are looking forward to Bertie visit. We'll all we should all be. Are we meeting at Benny's home? I have asked him if he can meet there. Um, I think maybe uh, I'll call him up tomorrow just to confirm the venue. Okay, okay. okay. Because uh, you uh, you need to confirm to us all. Yes, here. I will do that. Elizabeth uh, needs to hear it and Sharda and me too. So, but uh, uh, I'll definitely come. If not the others and my family, myself. <laughs> oh, we're looking forward to Bertie. Looking forward to. God bless. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Sanjay Ranke, how are you? You're looking fit as always. <laughs> Any idea, Pastor, when Pastor Zakra and family are returning? Yes, they are returning on 19th of this month. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. How's your family? Oh, all is well, Bertie, by God's grace. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Pray uh, that I'm able to come attend the feast. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, yeah, I've not mentioned to my <laughs> employers, but uh, yeah, 50 50. It will increase more. We are praying. Yeah, thank you. I should go, uh, God will help. Thank yes. you, Lord. Yeah. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everyone. Yeah. God bless. Bye. So I think we can conclude a study today. If I can just have a word of prayer and submit all of us into his hand. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Truly, truly thankful for who we are, what you are and who we are uh, in relation to you through Christ, O oh Lord. And what, what a privilege, O oh Lord, to be called your children uh, and uh, the co-heirs, Lord, with Christ. Thank you for your faithfulness in our life. Thank you for your very presence that is, takes control of our life, O oh Lord. And Lord, with that uh, thankfulness, we thank you for the, the wonderful news of Bertie getting uh, our work, oh Lord. Uh, thank you for your favor, Lord, answering our prayer and giving him work. I pray, oh Lord, that you give him favor in his work, oh Lord. I give him strength as he work, oh Lord, God. And most importantly, as the, the in September, uh, uh, annual uh, conference is coming, a uh, celebration, Lord, we pray that uh, let him get the leave. Thank you once again for seeing Uncle Sanjeev Rao, uh, Surya Murthy, Pauline, uh, Anil and Rekha, oh Lord. Um, and, and all of us who could, uh, uh, Praveen, myself, everyone who could join, oh Lord, um, we, we thank you, Lord, for, for looking after us and for being with us. Lord, we submit ourselves into your hand and Lord, we pray that you take control of our life. Lord, guide us, guard us, protect us. And again, we pray that let your joy be the portion of our, for our joy, Lord, Lord. Thank you once again for this time that we could come together read and learn about your word and your spirit um, transforming us and giving us more and more insight of who you are as you have revealed in jesus christ so lord I want to thank you and submit all of us into your hand uh, thank you once again for everything in the most precious name of jesus we pray and we believe amen amen, amen. thank you sachin thank you for the
Bye.